This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. There are a variety of um, app platforms and now a variety of different sensors that will hopefully be a massive advantage as we try and combat metabolic syndrome, obesity, but also those of us that don't have to worry about those things, thankfully, to really make ourselves optimal and healthy and live longer. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes and this is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Today my guest is Brianna Stubbs, a British-born but now San Francisco-based biohacker and expert on the subject of ketone metabolism. Ketosis is a subject that keeps cropping up on this podcast, especially when we talk about fasting and calorie Restrictions. So we'll talk about that in some detail. Brie also has another claim to fame. At the age of 12, she became the youngest person to row across the English Channel. And last year, she won a gold medal for Team GB Great Britain at the 2016 World Rowing Championships at Rotterdam in the Netherlands. It's great to see you. Thank you very much for having me. It's beautiful here in LA. Well, it's a gorgeous place. Certainly it? the weather's a lot better than in the UK. That was going to be my first question. You've only really just moved to California, haven't you? Yeah, I arrived about two months ago. I think the one thing that strikes me the most is just the lack of rain. Back home in the UK, I actually went back to graduate from my PhD about two weeks ago and I was on the coach from Heathrow Airport back to Oxford and it was raining sideways and it was the first time I'd seen (laughs) rain in two months. I was like, oh man, I didn't miss this at all. That um, old horizontal rain. Yeah, yeah, you just forget. Forget what rain's like when you're here in California. It's much more predictably pleasant. Of course, you weren't here last winter then when we had some record rainfall, no. which, which is actually very welcome. Yeah, I'm sure with the drought, you need to uh, keep everything fertile and growing. What do you like so far most about California, apart from the obvious, the weather? Everyone's very relaxed here. Um, everyone's very friendly I would say that the people uh, fit nicely in with the people, but also being based in a Silicon Valley company, especially having come out of a really high achieving academic and sporting kind of background. I think a problem that a lot of people have getting out of those environments is that they go to a working environment where the ethos isn't the same, where people aren't necessarily as driven and as passionate about what they're doing and exacting in their standards. So for me, joining Human, the company that I now work for, they're a leading biohacking company, got fantastic investors, Andreessen Horowitz, Joe Montana has invested. There's just so much energy in the company to tackle the problem of human enhancement and look at all these interesting scientific questions and how we can empower people to improve their own lives themselves um, on a personal kind of level. Uh, having that really exciting mission and working with people that are as passionate about it as me is something that I'm finding terrifically exciting. And so I think the feeling in Silicon Valley and in California for me is of endless possibility. And it's, yeah, it's really energizing. Mm, it's great, isn't it? And, and human, of course, HVMN is the way that yeah. it's spelled. Uh, formerly Nutribox, and we've had Jeff Wu, your colleague, on the podcast uh, just in the last few weeks. And it's all about human enhancement. That's probably the best phrase to sum up what you do at the company. Yeah, I mean, I think coming into the company, uh, I had a lot of questions about biohacking. Um, As an athlete, it wasn't necessarily a term I was very familiar with. And it certainly smacked really strongly of Silicon Valley and like computers and things that I wouldn't necessarily have associated with how I was living my life but actually as an elite athlete I was biohacking all of the time if you take biohacking to mean looking at the inputs that you're manipulating in your life and then taking a quantitative approach to measuring the output so you're kind of the black box in the middle and you can play with what you what you do and then see how effective that is for yourself personally so as an athlete I was always um, measuring my sleep quality I sometimes I would use a sleep tracker 
um, trying to improve the quality of my sleep to allow me to train and perform better. I was interested in heart rate variability um, and how that changed in response to different types of training. Um, as a lightweight rower, I had to be very, very attuned to my diet and what different, you know, playing with different macronutrient compositions to make sure that I had energy, but also was the correct body composition to be the correct weight. So actually, once I kind of got past that initial question mark of ah, biohacking, this is a bit of a weird term to me. I understood that it was something that I was doing myself all of the time. It's really just another word for self-experimentation, yeah, isn't for it? Sure. That, that a lot of people, athletes, do all the time. For sure. And I think what we stand for at Human is be, bringing that all together, being the hub for that kind of uh, inquisitive mind. People now with the explosion in technology things in terms of inputs and things in terms of measuring outputs are developing very quickly. And so we want to empower people to make full use of all of this emerging technology. And I guess um, my own research with the ketone, exogenous ketone metabolism and ketone esters is one very powerful new input. And so we're interested, therefore, on in how that can change our metabolic outputs. And ketosis and exogenous ketones could therefore be a biohack which obviously your listeners are kind of maybe familiar with as an idea. Well, that's why really one of the big reasons I want to talk to you about, because we've touched on this subject many times. We've talked about fasting and calorie restriction. So I would like to get into that in some detail. But first, let's go back on, on your story. Yeah. And, it, and it's been quite a story. Tell me about growing up in the UK, where you went to school and, and what interested you. So the biggest sort of figure in my life as I was growing up was my dad. He um, took part in the first ever ocean rowing race in 1997. And um, when he signed up for the race, he didn't even know how to row. He went, he signed, he saw this advert in the papers um, that read something along the lines of Shea, Sir Shea Blythe sets a challenge to rival Everest. And at this point, it had never been done before. More people had set foot on the moon than had rowed the Atlantic. And it really captured his imagination. He'd been in the Falklands War. He was a firefighter, like super active, a uh, real sort of thirst for life and thirst for adventure and so this was kind of the environment that I was growing up in my dad taking on this kind of seemingly impossible challenge or this very very extreme challenge and I saw all of the hard work he had to put in to fundraise for this and all of the preparations and then eventually um, completing the crossing they finished sixth there was um, a, a number of boats that finished but you know I, I remember being there in Barbados to see him come in and this was before satellite phones existed so he'd just been in the ocean for 60 days and we hadn't heard from him it was really inspiring and I think uh, yeah I definitely grew up in an environment where anything was possible and encouraged to push myself um, I managed to get my parents so I said my dad was a firefighter and my mum was a nurse um, they very much fostered kind of my intellectual curiosity neither of them had been to university but they spent a lot of time reading to me and things like that and it meant that I was able to get a scholarship to go to a sixth form college where I could combine rowing with studying uh, much more effectively than if I'd been going to uh, state uh, government funded school um, so that was sort of a, a very key point for me being able to train at the high level and also do my academics but as, as you mentioned in that kind of intervening time I'd also been able to row the channel with my with my dad when he was when I was 12 um, he was preparing for another ocean rowing attempt at that time so yeah up until I was 13 my dad was doing these crazy crazy challenges and so for me it was quite natural to just assume that I could could have a go at anything that I wanted to put my mind to. Um, well, and tell me about that experience then at the age of 12. Yeah. I mean, that, that is quite something. And, and you know, for, for most 12-year-old girls in, in England, that is something that's uh, pretty unachievable. So I remember I went into my dad's office and he was doing some, some of the planning for the row. And I sat down and I was like, Dad, can I, can I do something with you? What can I do? What can, we, what can we do? Can I come? You know, he'd always ask me if I wanted to come on the Atlantic and I don't think my mum would have ever let him take me on a big trip like that. But they would often do weekend long trips along the coast in the boat to practice for the eventual ocean crossing. And um, so we, we sort of formulated a plan to do the channel. And I remember um, it was all very exciting because the news crews covered it and I had a chance to speak to cameras and um, we set off and it was a beautiful day. And then we got out of sight of the land and I got terrifically seasick. And I remember it was it was such a fun bonding experience with my dad because he actually got really seasick as well. And the two of us were there with this 
bucket and it was absolutely I mean <laughs> you look back now it was horrific and but they were you know really accommodating of me um they let me so we did two hour shifts on the oars all through the night um and I think they might have let me miss one shift in the middle of the night but I was sleeping out on the deck um, of the boat so the boat um, isn't like a normal rowing boat like you'd see at the Olympics it's got cabins at either end for people to sleep in because obviously you're going to be at sea for a number of days um but I was sleeping out on the deck and I remember being in the middle of the channel and I actually flattened out in the middle of the night and the sense of quiet and um, the stars and the dark. And it was just, it was a really, it's sort of kind of transcendent kind of experience, mm. very still, um, very peaceful. And I think I remember that really kind of sticking with me and yeah, feeling very privileged that I could be able to that I could do something like that and I remember the next morning waking up and being able to see France because we hadn't gone from Dover to Calais which is sort of 25 miles we'd gone from Poole which is where my family live over to Cherbourg so it was more like 60 to 70 miles and I remember waking up and seeing France and feeling this kind of fantastic sense of achievement uh, landing in at the other end and having I, I remember saying that I'd um, had uh, Walker's crisps and Walker's crisps then sent me a box of crisps because I'd mentioned <laughs> that I'd had had some crisps when I landed which was all quite um, a novelty and then we um, and of course you you deserve anything having once, once you've been doing reached that. an achievement like that yeah well, I mean you'd, we'd been eating um, rehydrated foods like the military would yeah. have um, but that's nothing compared with like proper solid food so uh, yeah, I don't know how they survived for 60 days on rehydrated food. It wouldn't be something personally I'd like to do. But I remember as well then we sailed back on a yacht towing the boat behind us. And I think we did it over the weekend. And I think later that week I had exams at school. And so there's this fantastic picture of me sitting or actually asleep in the yacht with some of my books out. So obviously I'd been trying to have a little read of for get ready for a history exam or something like that and just fallen asleep on the way back. But and um but that's the sort of person that I am. I was always kind of full on, always interested and, you know, def- never, never let the rowing take away from my studies, I suppose, as well. And it's always a, an interesting dichotomy, if you like, balancing a, a, a physical activity career and an athletic career with academia as well. And, and you were doing that at, yeah. at quite a young age. Yeah, I think when I... When I decided that I wanted to do my PhD, a lot of people told me it would be very difficult to do the PhD and row at an international level. But because, as I just said, I've been doing it from such a young age, every every little development was kind of incremental. And I do think that by the time that I finished my PhD, it probably was no longer sustainable for a long period of time. But um, yeah, so I rode um, through my, doing my GCSEs and then at A-level, I would, did my first ever international race for GB. Um, and so I was selected for the Junior World Championships and won a silver medal. And so that was, you know, next step up. You know, it was trying to trial, trying to be in the world. Um, then I went to Oxford University and I rode in the varsity boat race so the Oxford Cambridge boat race for two my first two years there and won and again I rode for the under 23 British team so that was like another step up because uh, at university you have to be much more independent managing your time it's a lot less structured at school everything was kind of laid on for me Um, but at university you had to sort of take charge a lot more and so then the next progression on from that was to do my postgraduate study after I'd finished my undergraduate uh, BSc Um, And then I had a lot more independence in terms of my research, but also a lot more expectation from the research and a lot more expectation from the rowing as well being because I was funded by the UK lottery as a sort of a demi professional athlete. I had a grant. Um, And so really, I was very heavily committed on both fronts. And I remember before I started off being like, oh, you know, there's 24 hours in the day, you know, I can just you know, sort of having a think about well, I was going to I'd... ask you about the time management. You must have had to use some quite novel tactics to, to fit in the, the physical exercise and the training sessions with uh, your studies. Yeah, I think it was just about um, using every bit of time that was available to you in the most effective way that was for that time. So sleep time was always for sleep time. I had to be very, very disciplined about getting to bed trying to be in bed by 10 o'clock, for example, because I was getting up at 5.45 to leave the house at 6.30 to go to training. Um, And I used to get very frustrated with the car drive because it was dead time. And in the end, I ended up getting really into a broad range of podcasts and I felt like that made the time a little bit less dead. Um, You're like me on my morning commute. I get frustrated at what you consider to be dead time. But it doesn't have to be. And then you find ways of, exactly, of productively filling that time. Exactly, exactly. And um, especially because... 
the field of science that I was interested in and I was interested in sort of sports and exercise physiology and ketosis and you know I had a broad range of interests that are actually being covered widely now on podcasts I felt like I could do things that was relevant was relevant to my work whilst I was traveling so travel train um, and then we'd have a break in between sessions and I would you know how you have that like morning hour where you clear emails and do tiny little mundane boring tasks that's the other frustrating Uh, hour of the morning so I do that in between my two rowing sessions do my third one travel back to Oxford and so most days I'd be back by lunchtime Uh, And then it would just be stay in the lab until the work was done. But initially I was trying to do the full um, set program that the GB athletes were on and my PhD work as well. And in the end, it became apparent that I needed a few days where I was in the lab first thing in the morning. Um, And so I was able to negotiate with the team and they were supportive of me taking two days where I would train in Oxford rather than at the central uh, training facility. And did you come to a point in your career when you had to make a decision? It's it's either pursue athletics or pursue academia full time. Thankfully. That perhaps you couldn't do both forever? Well, thankfully, I didn't have to until recently. But for me, it became less of a difficult choice because I'd won the world championships. The Olympic Games happened in Rio last summer. And so for me, there was going to be another four years of training for the opportunity to go on better because having won the world championships the next step from that is to row in the olympic games and so there was just too many uncontrollables in in that four-year box you know would i get injured would i even be good enough as an individual and a lot of that was dependent on who else was on going to stay on the team who else was coming and going and people moving up and um so there were just a lot of unknowns and then i had this opportunity to kind of pursue my research passion and take something that I've been working on and apply it in the real world and so I felt like that was too much of an opportunity to pass up. I do miss training as a full-time athlete and I still get up every morning at seven and go and run and I ran a half marathon in San Francisco which was fantastic. I mean I'm enjoying the change. After a while the routine of training really wears you down and emotionally I was just very frazzled because everything has to be perfect and you always you spend a lot of time criticizing yourself as and looking for ways to improve which makes you better ultimately but it doesn't always make you happier and so I think a bit of time to decompress and and be kind to myself and do things that I enjoy because I want to rather than because it's on the training program is I feel very refreshed and actually the team for this year's world championships which is in Florida was was announced today and I feel a mix of was emotions. Was just a little bit of you thinking, mm, yeah. if only, maybe, whatever? I feel a mix of emotions. I said, it's, um, I, I'm really excited and happy that other people have the opportunity to do what I did. I feel like if I would still been training, would I be there? Or would I not? Because actually back in January, I, after, as I was submitting and defending my PhD, I was so stressed that I was struggling to make weight because of cortisol and the stress. And, uh, you know, my body my body was telling me that it had enough. And so actually, would I have made it? I don't know. If I'd been fit and well, then maybe. And then if we were in the crew, how would I feel about coming back as a defending champion? You know, the pressure to hit the gold medal again. and But then I miss, you know, the camaraderie of training and with my, you know, there's a lot of things mm-hmm. that I miss. And so, yeah, it's bittersweet. Um, but I do feel so much more kind of grounded and zen and content now that I'm having a bit of time to to look after myself properly. It's interesting. You were almost your own human guinea pig going through those physical challenges and seeing how your body responded to everything that you were going through, your training, the stress that you were under. That had some correlation with your academic studies. Didn't it? Certainly. I mean, the th- I was so fortunate in that um, our lab was looking at ketones for human performance. And so there was sort of the athletic side that I was reading around and finding out about sports physiology and uh, exercise metabolism and things like that and getting to work with athletes in in the lab. But then also ketones, evolutionarily, they're a byproduct of starvation metabolism. And as a lightweight, I kind of felt like I was living the starvation metabolism dream all of the time, Mm. you know. So it actually hit a lot of areas that I was very kind of personally experienced in. I think I was very lucky to, I don't think very many people have a research area that they live themselves so much. And it is 
quite niche, isn't it? It's very niche. Let's talk about it then. Ketones, ketone metabolism. Ketones are chemicals, they're sources of energy. Let's just go back to the absolute basics and describe what we're talking about. So I think uh, the first thing to point out is that ketone is a chemical term that refers to carbon joined by a double bond to oxygen. So there are compounds out there that can be called ketones that aren't necessarily referring to the biological ketones that are found in our body. And one example of that is raspberry ketones. And so some people get very confused about raspberry ketones. They think that they might be a physiological ketone ketone body when people talk about ketosis and things like that but actually raspberry ketones have a very different chemical structure they have a a ring of carbons in the molecule but they do have this carbon double bonded to an oxygen which means that technically they are a ketone but not a biological ketone right so biologically ketone bodies are beta hydroxybutyrate acetoacetate and acetone those are the three that we see in human physiology they're the ones that our body can produce and the ones that our body can use for fuel so under what circumstances does the body produce these chemicals and and what are they for they result from a period of carbohydrate deprivation basically if you starve or if you follow a ketogenic diet for a long period of time insulin levels are very low that means that your fat releases free fatty acids into the blood the free fatty acids are transported in the blood to the liver and the liver is the main organ that's responsible for producing ketones for the rest of the body so um it low insulin as a result of low dietary carbohydrate intake whether that's fasting or a ketogenic diet that's the main sort of physiological circumstances under which ketones are produced. Evolutionarily, the main reason for ketone production is to fuel the brain. So the brain is a very metabolically greedy organ. It accounts for like a, a large percentage of our daily uh, energy requirement. But fat is unable to cross into the brain. The brain relies very heavily on glucose metabolism to keep it functioning. And we all know the feeling mid-afternoon, a bit of a slump, bit of a a biscuit or a sugary cup of tea if you're in the UK Mm -hmm. picks you up and you feel a lot better because the brain needs blood glucose to function but as an organism we don't actually have that much stored glucose Uh, we have maybe about a thousand calories of glucose in our liver in our muscles well the thing is the glucose in your muscles it can't be used by the brain the muscle can't release it it can only use itself but the liver is the main organ that's responsible for outputting glucose to keep our blood glucose levels constant but so uh, after what period of of not eating do we essentially have no glucose left to to use it varies person to person um Eight to 12 hours, I would say, is a sort of a a rough guide. Obviously, that can be accelerated if you exercise. But also, exhaustion of glucose supplies doesn't... It doesn't mean that a switch is flipped and ketosis automatically kind of happens. It can take several days for people to get into ketosis, and that is dependent on everyone's individual metabolism. So, for example, at Human, we do a weekly fast, and sometimes we read our blood ketone levels during the time while we're fasting. And uh, we read our blood ketone levels one afternoon and I was at 1.1 millimole, which is quite high, but I'd been for a run that morning. And my colleague, Jeff Wu, who you said has been mm. on this podcast before, he was at 0.8, 0.9. So there's individual differences in how quickly. And then bear in mind that both of us fast regularly. And so that it might vary if someone doesn't fast regularly. Depends on what meal you ate the night before as to how carbohydrate rich that was, as to how long it takes to deplete your stores. Things like that can all affect how long it can take your body to start producing its own ketones. So ketone production occurs when carbohydrate uh, stores are, are b- become completely depleted and then ketones in the blood can act as a fuel for way of making fat accessible for the brain. So I suppose the question is, and, and this is clearly what you're looking at, to what extent do we manipulate the way that we live to affect ketone production and, and how does that benefit us? Indeed, does it benefit us? So following a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet has a sort of a slew of health benefits um, that are relatively well documented in the literature. Um, Following a low carbohydrate diet is a good strategy for weight loss. First up, um, low carbohydrate ketogenic diets have been used to treat paediatric epilepsy. So that's drug resistant epilepsy and reducing seizures in infants. 
carbohydrate reduction is sort of proposed to be a very good way of controlling metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes and then emerging research in animals is kind of suggesting that calorie restriction and being in ketosis could be helpful for health and longevity so you may want to manipulate your ketone levels for all of those different reasons however it's not always clear whether the benefits are coming from having ketones in the blood so being in ketosis or following a diet because when you follow a ketogenic diet, you're consuming high levels of fats and also restricting your dietary carbohydrate intake. So there's quite a lot of different things that are changing. But what I was working on was a way of raising ketone levels very rapidly to levels that would take quite a long time to achieve naturally. Um, and whether that situation is the same as when you've got there yourself over a long period of time with low levels of carbohydrate, high levels of fat, thing, things like that. So I think what's quite exciting about the ketone drink, ketone ester drink that I've been working on, is that it provides a tool for scientists to now go on and explore what is the effects of ketone bodies themselves and what is the effect of following a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. So is, um, for example, one of the ways that beta-hydroxybutyrate, the ketone body, is meant to help you live longer is via acting on these things called histone deacetylase inhibitors. And so to, to make it very simple, it affects gene expression. And the changes in gene expression after beta-hydroxybutyrate exposure can help you to live longer. Just explain gene expression. Okay. There are proteins in our cells and proteins control the level of flux through enzyme pathways and control our metabolism and those proteins are coded for by genes so if you change your gene expression you could express more or less of different enzymes involved in metabolism or um, transport in through our cell membranes things like that so gene expression is kind of uh, the, the playbook mm. by which our cells then go out and, and execute its daily tasks so it's not known whether the changes to gene expression occur because of BHB or whether it's sort of also have to have a ketogenic diet and all of those other physiological things going on as well. One of the things we've we've touched on several times is the experience of, of being in ketosis, that process that, as you say, can start after maybe it's 24 hours for some people, maybe it's 36 or longer for others. But there is a, a common it's mostly anecdotal evidence, but it's that feeling of that brain agility of feeling great, yeah. actually, and, and not just physically, but mostly mentally, that you can achieve more and maybe faster, think faster, just get more stuff done when you're in that state. Do we know why? Well, I don't think we know exactly why. I think it makes sense with what we were discussing a second ago about ketones main reason for existence being to fuel the brain. So I think that would be kind of the first the first argument that I would make. Ketones are designed to fuel our brains, and that might be where we feel clarity and feel better. There's some interesting interesting science looking at ketones and energy metabolism. So our cells produce energy in, in these little organelles called mitochondria, which are like the cell's batteries. And um, some research done by some collaborators of ours in Oxford suggested that ketones help mitochondria to produce better quality energy. So the universal energy currency of the cell is called ATP and it's an adenosine with three phosphates joined. And how the cell does work is by breaking the bond between one phosphate and the, the very end phosphate on the chain. So releasing energy like that. So what happens when you feed the mitochondria and the cell's ketones is that there is a bit more inherent stored energy in that ATP. So the same number of ATP is produced, but it's kind of better quality. It's got more potential to do work. So with ATP that are produced with ketone metabolism, that potentially, they have more potential to do work that can mean that they're a better fuel source for the brain and for the body. Whilst these kind of calculations that sort of inform that hypothesis are based on quite a few assumptions there were um, in the equations that they used, the experiment, the ultimate kind of observation of this experiment, which I'm describing, is that an isolated rat heart, it did 28% more work using the same amount of oxygen. So it was a lot more efficient, able to perform. 
So I think that ketones are a sort of a very high quality energy source and that might be why people feel more mental clarity. And if we make the correlation with the old hunter-gatherer times when you might have been in a a starved state and you need to use your brain to get out of that situation to find food, there's a certain logic there. Yeah, it's like, are we born to think or are we born to run? Like, how how are we going to select our fuels based on the, the need at that time? Um, I think another reason why people might feel mental clarity is because people go in and if people following a normal mixed diet, high in refined sugars, say, they're going to be going their blood glucose and blood insulin levels up and down and up and down all the time. And that can lead to brain fog. And so people who reduce their consumption of refined sugar often report feeling more mentally clear anyway. So this might be that um, experience might be an intermediate experience on to compared with how you feel when you're on in ketosis and when you're in ketosis as you've already talked about it can start after different periods of not eating and i know you have and i have as well and and others experimented with different types of of fasting regimes whether it's 36 hours whether it's 12 hours people will go for a seven day water fast which is something that i've i've never done i've I've never had the the courage or, or indeed the inclination to do that What's your view? Uh, There probably isn't a simple answer to this, but in in terms of perhaps the most appropriate kind of fasting that we should be aiming for if if we feel it's good for us? There's a lot of debate, as you say, in the literature. And I think what... Uh, one thing that came across from what you were just saying quite nicely is it has to be what fits in with your own lifestyle. And so, as I said, when I joined the company here in San Francisco, their, uh, their weekly protocol is 36 hours. And I've did done that a few times but I really do feel quite weak and a bit I not not super great by the end of the day so now I'm experimenting with 24 so I think as a biohacker you have to take into account your own individual experience and I'll do 24 hours now for a few weeks and then maybe try 36 again and you know and how often do you do that and just to tease that out for people who've maybe never done this 24 hours can be as simple as dinner finishing to dinner. dinner to dinner yeah. yes I mean it's, it's finishing at tea time on Monday and having your next meal at tea time on Tuesday it's great actually because um, tea time in English terms yeah say. sure <laughs> um, no it's you're great you're bringing it back out in me you see. yeah 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 go and have some supper and some tea and scones yes. um <laughs> Yeah, I find that just like mentally much sort of much easier um, to know that I'm going to have a meal in the evening. But some people prefer to run run maybe lunchtime to lunchtime. It it does that doesn't really matter. And there are simple ways of building fasting into your protocol. So you can do this thing called sixteen eight, which means you fast for sixteen hours and then eat in an eight hour time window. But actually, that's sort of like two p.m. through to so you could have lunch and dinner. Well, um, I've done that quite a lot. My, my 16, I usually actually have dinner at 6 p.m. and a late breakfast at 10 a.m. at yeah. 16 hours, which, yeah. which doesn't really seem that difficult. No. Isn't so I, that difficult? It's very easy for people to start building it into the lifestyle. So I'd say if you have listeners that have never tried it, then 16, 8 is a great place to start. 24 hours is the next progression on from that. Then then if you feel good, 36. I mean, I was going to say, can you tease out for us what the, you think the benefits are of something like 16, 8? Because from what you've already said, we're not really getting much into ketosis by the end of 16 hours. Are we? No, um, there are several ways in which it could be beneficial. Not all of them are properly understood yet. This is all kind of still surrounded by conjecture in the literature. However, every time that we eat, we secrete insulin. And so if you do not eat for 16 hours, you're giving your body a block of time where there's no insulin release. And that gives your cells time to be catabolic, which means breaking things down rather than anabolic, which is building things up. And insulin is a very powerful anabolic signal. And so you're giving your body time to chew through all of the excesses that we put in it. Um, There's a process called autophagy, which I'm sure your listeners have Mm -hmm. heard you discuss before. And as you say, it's not really that well understood when that really starts but you're giving yourself some time to to get there as a as a first attempt. And autophagy is essentially it, it's throwing out all of those those cells that are, are maybe not working properly, damaged cells, old cells, and then you you refeed and you grow new cells. Yeah, exactly. So um, for me, that would be the the underlying reason to to try periods of fasting to give your body a break from from insulin, a break from storage, to allow autophagy to begin to take place. 
also personally as an experientially I find that it helps me to kind of recalibrate my feeling of when I need to eat so especially when I'm running around and I'm doing a lot of physical activity and I'm thinking a lot I can sometimes get into habits of snacking and a period of fasting where I've got a clear defined I'm not eating during this time and I'm mindful about that helps me to build awareness of when I'm eating back into my life and I think that having a practice of being more mindful around food is just healthy full stop so that's something that I take away from it personally. And how do you Clearly, social issues come into play big time with people who try to experiment with these kinds of of lifestyles. And very often the excuse in adverted commas from some people is that, well, I just can't do it because people want me to go to lunch or to dinner and there are pressures in my life and there are family commitments and and that kind of thing. You strike me as someone you're quite disciplined. You you talk about using every minute of the day to to, to do things. We, We all try to do these things. From a social perspective, how do you deal with that? Well, I think that's why it's quite nice to have a different fasting protocols available to you to experiment with because it may be... Uh, for example, last week I had a dinner on Tuesday evening. That's when we normally fast. So I said, decided to myself that I was going to fast for 24 hours and have dinner dear, as arranged. And that was fine. So it didn't have to interfere. I, I think it's very rare that seven days a week you have a commitment at lunch and at dinner. Breakfast is one that people can normally miss relatively easily. It's the least sociable it's, meal, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. It's the easiest that. one to drop. Exactly. And then I think there's very few people that have lunch and dinner every single day of the week. So you just have to make it fit in around your lifestyle. And that was how I made my athletics fit around my PhD. You just have to take a kind of, you have to decide if it's going to be a priority for you. And if it's a priority, there'll be a time when you can fit it in. There's always time for the things that you want to do. That you really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and quite a lot of forward planning as well. Yeah, for sure. You have to be aware of your schedule and, and be aware of all of the dependencies on that and it must be one of the thrilling things about working with the company and the colleagues that you have now is that you're very like-minded so yeah which is quite an unusual situation in terms of a workplace scenario that you have certain regimes at a personal level that all of your colleagues seem to share as well yeah i think um fasting with people definitely makes it much easier so i'd encourage people if they're thinking about trying it to talk to friends or family and see if they want to try too I think there are plenty of good scientific reviews that are quite accessible to lay people or good articles or podcasts like this where I think people should be convinced that there's enough good reasons to try it at least. I fasted a couple of times with people at home before I moved out and joined the company and people found it generally like quite a positive experience on a lot of levels. So um, I think the social aspect definitely makes it easier and more fun. At Human, we have a community called WeFast, which is an online fasting community and looking at the way that people use the community to ask questions and share success stories and, and you know, problems as well. I think that community is a real strength of the company and something that can be used to make fasting easier if we're more social about it. And I think we should say, and you can probably embellish on this as well, that fasting isn't for everyone. We're talking about it in very positive terms, but yep. fasting fasting can be dangerous. Fasting can kill in extreme scenarios. And I certainly wouldn't want to recommend it to anyone. I think everyone should speak to their doctor if they are considering something like this, because it, it may well not be for you. No, fasting and, and ketosis and, and also taking ketone supplements, it's a ve- very fundamental change to your metabolism. Metabolism is at the centre of virtually all of the processes of our body can be altered by altering fuel substrates, uh, the availability of fuel sub- substrates, whether that's glucose or whether that's fats or whether that's providing protein and ketones. Like Metabolism is so crucial to life that, yeah, I think you raise a very important point that people need to be mindful of how powerful the tools that they're playing with are and and be thoughtful about how, how they use it. Make sure that if you're, for example, pregnant, then you wouldn't, wouldn't want to be fasting. If you're diabetic, you'd want to make sure that you've got some physician sort of overseeing you or make sure that if if not that you're very very up to speed on your own blood glucose readings and the insulin that you take and things like that you, you know there's no, nothing barring a thoughtful person from trying it but it should be undertaken kind of mindfully because it you might need to for example increase the amount of water that you're drinking fasting dehydrates you so that would be one piece of advice you'd give to someone as they embark on fasting make sure you hydrate make sure that you get some electrolytes things like that so 
don't don't just try it without without thinking about it first as you, with all things you've, you've mentioned a few times taking your own blood glucose measurements one of the exciting areas here is the technology yeah as it's developing that, that's available to do this kind of thing yeah it's becoming easier and easier and there are a variety of um, app platforms and now a variety of different sensors whether they're finger prick blood glucose uh, readers or whether they're continuous glucose monitors as well which gives you a much more detailed picture of what's happening in your body and I think that like you say this is one of the things that's like terrifically exciting there's talk you know maybe one day Apple Watch will have a built-in glucometer for example and that would be very exciting because all of a sudden everyone's empowered or everyone who can afford the really expensive Apple Watch mm. let's just say um, is is empowered to see okay so I had a Coca-Cola uh, that's what happened to my blood sugar okay I had a fruit juice oh my word exactly the same thing happened Everyone's got different responses to different stimuli. You know, oh, I exercised and this happened to my blood sugar. Oh, this happens while I sleep. It's a massively powerful tool to really tease out our individual responses to things in our lives. And so I think that that will hopefully be a massive um, advantage as we try and combat metabolic syndrome, obesity, but also those of us that don't have to worry about those things, thankfully, to really make ourselves optimal and healthy and live longer. Imagine a point in the future when we will look back and think, gosh, we didn't even measure that. We didn't know the effect of, as you say, eating different foods. We were totally oblivious to all of this knowledge that uh, really could have, have affected how we managed our diets and exercise regimes as we grew up and might have affected us in very dramatic ways. It's very funny you should say that because you almost feel like we've discovered everything that we're going to discover and there's no new fields left to discover. But the gut microbiome is a field that's arrived on the scene within the last couple of years. And all of a sudden people are like, the gut is the next final frontier. You know, understanding how our bio microbiomes are different individually, how it um, interacts with depression and other like illnesses. And all of a sudden there's a massive explosion of interest in this brand new field. And maybe, as you say, in 10 years time, it'll be like, gosh, we didn't have our own microbiome profile. We didn't understand how to do that. You know, I feel like metabolic monitoring is of the same. Maybe I think a little bit behind where the microbiome is. Maybe. I mean, there are commercial sensors available, but I think that there's still quite a lot of friction and it's not sort of widely adopted. I think, you know, we can measure blood glucose continuously, but really we need to be able to measure blood ketones and blood fats as well. You know, you need you need a sensor that does more things. Yeah. And bacteria. Just the level of bacteria, the different type of bacteria, not just in the gut, but in, in the mouth. And on the skin. On the skin. Yeah. And the mindset that they're not bad for us. In fact, we need them. That They are good. Yeah. I think um, as, as everything in moderation, <laughs> like good bacteria, bad bacteria, right. moderation, keto, ketosis, fasting with moderation. But, it, but it's not, being able to measure that to make the judgment. To know whether it is in moderation. It's the same with carbohydrate, right? Uh, I think a lot of people assume that I must be on like a keto diet myself or that I would strongly advocate athletes to be on a ketogenic diet. And actually um, having having the lived experience as an athlete and especially one trying to do quite high intensity exercise, carbohydrates are important for that. And the emerging paradigm from the advisory bodies is that carbohydrate intake should be periodized and tailored around your activity level. So it all depends on your individual goals. And so if you want to run an ultra marathon or an Ironman, or if you're if you're recreationally active, a middle aged athlete, you know, training competitively for an endurance event and performance isn't absolutely the be all and end all then ketosis may be like a good strategy to be able to burn more fat and being on a ketogenic diet certainly upregulates your ability to burn fat from some published studies have shown that at the normal value for fat burn oxidation during exercise it's 0.6 to 0.7 grams per minute that can be nearly doubled in an athlete that's fat adapted so there's certainly profound metabolic changes that can occur as a result of dietary manipulation. But it does seem to be that um, athletes following this diet now, you know, sneak in carbs in around hard exercise. And so I think we're getting to a better understanding of how the ketogenic diet affects performance. And I certainly include carbohydrate in my diet because I think it's an important 
important macronutrient to be able to perform at a high intensity. And could you maybe just give us a a definition, a, a description of a ketogenic diet? Well, I mean, like the highest level description is a diet that's low enough in carbohydrate that you're producing ketones. That threshold, unfortunately, varies from person to person. And so some people have to go as low as 20 grams of carbohydrate a day. Some people get away with 50. And then some athletes can still be in ketosis eating maybe 100 or 150 grams of carbohydrate. So it's very variable. Um, The classic Atkins diet involves uh, restriction down and then you increase your carbohydrates back up again to sort of find a critical level at which your body is still producing ketones. So, I mean, yeah, I think the important thing to highlight there is it's variable. The other important thing to highlight is that it's a high fat diet, low to moderate protein. It's not uh, equal in the distribution of fat to protein because unfortunately in the community people kind of get a bit hysterical about this, but protein can be used to make glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. And so that's a reason why people who are on a low carbohydrate diet may not be in ketosis because their protein intake is too high. I don't think that all protein that you put in your body automatically converts to glucose, but that is a pitfall that people sometimes run into when they're trying to get into ketosis and have restricted carbohydrates. They're just getting not enough of their energy from fat, too much from protein. What is your daily regime? I'm curious. You do all this kind of self-experimentation, at least you have over the years, and and I'm sure it'll continue and things things will change. But just give me a a snapshot into your day, the balance of exercise and and diet and, and, and general lifestyle. So since I'm not now training two to three times a day, I normally train my first session fasted unless it's a sprint session so I've been training for the half marathon I would do some sprint sessions and I would make sure that I ate before I did that and I would have carbohydrates so it would be maybe like oatmeal or some toast with peanut butter I'm a big nut butter fan like that's the carb one carbohydrate I couldn't give up peanut butter mm. um, and good protein too yeah good protein too. it's great nuts are great anything anything that's not refined I think I'm a big fan of because I think that nature tends to package things in with things that you need and right. uh, anyway that aside um don't get and me it started tastes on that good question. and it tastes great um so before a sort of high more high intensity session i would have some carbohydrate but most of the exercise that i do now is kind of more steady state so i would go for a bike ride ride for an hour 40 and i'd do that fast if you've if you've had enough to eat the night before it's normally fine um, are you doing this early in the morning yeah so we start work at sort of 9 to 10 a.m and so normally if i get up at sort of Six six thirty to seven, I can get in an hour, an hour and a half of exercise before I go into work, and I'm actually probably worse than I should be at taking rest days because. But I find exercise quite meditative, and I'm kind of addicted to the endorphins rush, and I like to get out. And there's um, some good research emerging around uh, exposure to light first thing in the morning and being good for your circadian rhythms and getting out and being out in nature as part of your kind of morning routine, even if it's just go outside and eat your breakfast, getting some natural light early in the day is really important for people. And, and you really benefit at night from that because you can get to sleep. Yeah, for sure. So I think normally day starts between half past six, seven o'clock. Um, if it's moderate intensity, low you know, endurance exercise, I would be, I'd go and do it fasted. Um, if it's sprints, I'd have something with some carbohydrate in before that. And also make sure to hydrate properly before you exercise as well. So I normally have a good glass of water or a cup of tea or, <laughs> or coffee, depending on, depending on how sleepy have I'm you, feeling. Have you found a, a good source of tea in San Francisco? I bought some back across with me. <laughs> Doesn't um, everyone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, San Francisco is not too, not too bad, I think. So um, coffee is good, though. Mm, coffee's great. Um, <laughs> much better than the UK. Yeah. Um, so, yeah food and water exercise and then I would come back and then I'd have breakfast so I'm not super rigid at the moment I either like a big bowl of fruit with some um, sugar-free yogurt so I like to go for Greek yogurt like full fat mm-hmm. yogurt I'm much more, I can't stomach the sort of artificially flavored ones anymore it's just much, much yeah. too sweet um, so a big bowl of um, melon or berries black blueberries that sort of thing with Greek yogurt or I'll have I'm really into omelets and avocados and eggs and bacon so I mean I certainly I don't come back and then fill up on toast and the more conventional kind of breakfast sources I guess so maybe maybe more of a lower carbohydrate breakfast but you know I would consider having maybe a slice of toast if I was feeling if I was feeling decadent Um, then we go into work I normally eat lunch sort of 
early to mid afternoon. Uh, I'm quite into salads and poke. That's something I've discovered over that we can't get in the UK. These like fantastic bowls with raw fish and and amame and all these great greens. Um, plenty of places to get good, healthful lunches around where we work in the financial district. But um, certainly again like not really an emphasis on wheats and grains but I just I'm just not doing enough exercise at the moment that I feel like I need it um, when I was preparing for the half marathon and training more I'd include more carbohydrate in my diet and I certainly indulge in treats now and again because having been a lightweight lightweight rower for four years there were so many times when I had to say no to things that I wanted so now you know I certainly You're still like, in that reward period yeah yeah <laughs> but some people I had a really interesting conversation with um the president of the Cambridge University Lightweight Women's Boat Club, and she was talking about supporting athletes of who, especially female athletes, academic type A personalities, like super, super intense people, the transition off being a lightweight where you've been super restricted to this period where you're now free can often be quite um, fraught, maybe more so than you'd think. You just assume, oh, no restriction, people are fine. But actually people go way too far the other way and you sort of talk about reward period and I don't really feel like I've had this period where I'm like yeah I can eat whatever I want I'm gonna go crazy I just now if I feel like a treat I think about when was the last time that I had a treat and then make a decision as to whether it's something I really want or not but um we work through till sort of 6 p.m um I do a lot of walking around the city I like to to go for a walk at lunchtime uh walk back to the transport to get home you know, if I really wanted to, I would sort of stretch or something like that in the evening. But I'm not I'm not as beholden to my exercise regime as I used to be. Do you do any resistance training? Yes. So, I mean, um, yeah, two or three times a week I go to the gym and I'm really getting into doing like body weight exercises. Um, I think eventually we have entered as a team a Spartan race in San Francisco. So I'm practicing my pull ups and my monkey bars and press ups. The good thing about resistance exercise is that you can do that at home. Um, I like to do, I just set up with some music in the kitchen and I'll do body weight squats and lunges and press ups and some core stability. The good thing about having a really strong athletic background is that I know all the exercises that I need to do. And so I just do like a minute on each exercise and cycle through and go for half an hour or so. And that can be if that's all I've got time for because I've got an early meeting. It's, it's funny because I suppose to normal people that would be like a good session, half an hour of body weight stuff for me. That's like, oh, I'm just kind of cramming something in because I didn't really have time. But <laughs> yeah, most so two to three times a week resistance. I like to bike, go for a long cycle ride at the weekend, you know, four to six hours if I can or, or a long run when I was training for the half marathon, go out and run for a couple of hours. I like um, using exercise as an excuse to, to see places. Once a week I go uh, to... Especially a new city. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. I feel like I'm much better orientated having been out on my bike and running. So I actually enjoy that experience, actually just working, visiting a, a different city, staying at the hotel and just going for a run. You feel a, a great sense of accomplishment just learning about the, the streets nearby, how to get from A to B, just because you've done a bit of exercise. And so many people don't engage. They get into a taxi cab or get on, even worse, get on like an underground transportation system and have no idea how nothing. everything actually yeah. fits together. So, yeah, get using running is just one of those things that I'm – increasingly passionate about because you just pick up a pair of shoes and you're off um and i think it's i think it's a fantastic tool running or walking because i suppose a lot of people may for injury reasons may not be able to run but walking especially if you walk briskly it can be a great form of exercise and you all, everyone has to start somewhere i think coming back to the idea of biohacking and personalizing your your protocol and your regime everyone's going to have a different starting point you know my starting point for this period of my life is having been an elite athlete and i'm having to redefine my idea of a lot of exercise to fit in with an you know a, a lifestyle where i now have a full time job i've you know Back in when I was training full time, only doing two sessions a day, that was n nothing. If I only worked out for an hour, that was a very, very light day. And now if I work out for an hour, then, you know, I've hit I've hit a good amount for that mm. day and that's fine. Uh, but still, like I said, I'm exercising six to seven days a week. I'm not very good at taking rest days because I feel like I'm doing nothing compared with what I used to. But we talk to someone of my age. I have friends who don't regularly exercise train and actually going out and running for half an hour for 5k that's great for them so everyone's starting from a different point in terms of exercise everyone's starting from a different point in terms of diet and it's not about looking at someone else and being like oh i'm rubbish because i have to be where they are actually just look at where you are and 
take tiny little baby steps at a time see if it makes you feel better see what you can cope with do things that you enjoy and do things that are good for you but starting from your own point rather than necessarily trying to make a big switch because that's not always going to stick mm. it's you know it's unrealistic to say to someone who's a couch potato right now i want you to train even four times a week or you know what's the government recommendation in the uk it's three times a week three times a week 30 minutes a week trying to get some people Which to do to, that to people like you uh, and i because I, I do quite a lot yeah it seems like nothing but to, to most people it can be actually quite a lot yeah and and certainly enough to yeah, keep people healthy for sure and also i suppose there's also a pressure in society right now that we always have to be changing to get better but then there's something to be said for periods of stability as well you know whew, i'm doing three times a week great let's do that for the next six months rather than like three to four to five or you know more or less you know just Everyone has I think to, for some people that increases the chances of actually not doing it if you try to do too much. Exactly. So I think um, sensitivity to an individual and setting yourself, you have to set yourself goals, but they should be achievable for you. And I think um, one thing that I did as an athlete every time that I had a p- performance coming up was have a gold, silver and a bronze target. And the bronze was something that I was like... 95% confident that I could achieve even on a, like a slightly dodgy day bronze would be but it was important to have a target in any case so that you know even if I finished and it hadn't gone as because really you don't want to get bronze you want to be hitting silver or gold silver would be like you know good day maybe a second you know maybe my pb would be the silver and then gold would be faster than my pb something that I would have to really get right to do but having these kind of like staged goals means that you're at least going to hit something so you can be like oh it wasn't a total disaster i hit bronze and so i think it's the same with lifestyle you know maybe goal number one is to exercise three times a week goal number um two is to exercise for an hour rather than an hour once a week Mm. rather than half an hour and then gold is this is feeling really great i'm exercising more regularly it's not feeling like a chore or you know we go back to fasting bronze would be 16 8 Gold, bronze, uh, silver would be 24 hours and then if you're feeling good on it and everything's going really well and it works for you then you can try a bit longer but setting achievable goals definitely makes the whole process run smoother so we uh, on this podcast focus on longevity and i always ask people what are your longevity goals do you think about your own personal longevity do you think about getting old and what you would like to achieve in that sphere yeah it's a really big question So I'm 26 recently and I suppose because everything's been so full on and my focuses have been so short term up until this point, I've been very focused on the very near present and haven't really thought a lot about um, exactly what I want my future to look like. And actually... Actually, my my first thought when you said you were 26, I knew you were in your 20s, I didn't know you were 26, mm -hmm. was, gosh, you've done a lot in your 26 years. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I I feel like uh, now's the sort of time for taking stock a little bit. But I think that successful people are able to appreciate what they've achieved and then look forward to the next thing. So I think that for me, this net new project working with human to kind of help people live healthier, better, longer lives, that's something that really kind of fires me up. Um, in terms of actually how long I'd like to live, I think that would be defined by the quality of my life. So I like to think in terms of... Um, health span rather than just straight up lifespan i would rather i would rather live to 85 and be have all of my marbles and still physically kind of able to do to do things than live to 100 and be in care or be very dependent on other people and perhaps a burden on other people as well so i think with the technology that's emerging health span will increase lifespan will increase as well what what do you think and i agree with everything you say and and it's kind of obvious that we don't want to live to be old and infirm we want to be old and and healthy and agile and and involved and sociable and and all of those good things what do you think and i know this is an impossible question Mm -hmm. but what do you think might be possible by the time that you get to 70 80 90 Well, I wonder, firstly, whether it'll be my generation that reaps the benefits of it. I wonder whether it'll be the generations that are being born now that are are going to be the ones that live into routinely into their hundreds. I wonder whether my generation, we're a a less healthy generation because of the environment that we're that we're living in that, that we brought up in now. That said, I mean, I know that in my cohort of people, a lot of people are a lot more aware of their health and 
taking a lot more steps to to optimize that so perhaps perhaps we will make it into into our hundreds i mean it'll be interesting to see the first generation that routinely breaks into triple figures what do i think will be possible for me just even thinking about it just raises so many questions scientifically but also socially as well how are we going to contribute to society how are we going to interact with society when we're 110 are we able to you effectively utilize all of the experience and manpower you know whether it's you know it's not necessarily going to be physical manpower that's offered by the elder generation but intellectually and socially are they able to contribute rather than just being a, a very you know difficult financial burden on the economy which is something that we're struggling with i don't know so much here in the us but in the uk the increasing burden of um, neurodegenerative diseases on the health service it's it's huge so Definitely linking health span and lifestyle span will be really important. What do I think will be possible? I'd love to say I think we'll see people routinely living over 100. I think that would be interesting um, and possible. And exciting. And exciting. I mean, like, what's the... And the other, the other part of the question I usually ask is, is why? I and mean, it's, it's kind of obvious to me, but why would we want to live a long life? What do you want to do with your life? Maybe that's the bigger question yeah. that, that those extra years will allow you to do. I think by the time that you have lived to that sort of age, you just have this wealth of experience, wealth of perspective. You react differently to stressful situations and to problems. And I think that insight would be valuable at all levels of society and could be uh, exploited much better than it is now. The longer you've lived, the more, I think, generally kind of like measured you have the ability to be because you've got experience of, of these things happening. You know, it's kind of everything seems a little bit less urgent. I think I think adding that layer of experience onto companies, onto governments would be very, very, very enriching. It's a great thought and a, an excellent way to finish. Brianna, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for listening to this podcast. A closing thought, once again, I should say that fasting regimes or ketogenic diets are not for everyone. If you're considering changing the way you eat or a new exercise program, you should seek the advice of your doctor first. Safety is everything. Now, just before we go, a reminder that there are several ways to listen to us via iTunes, Google Play Music, our website, llamapodcast.com, and, of course, iTunes. And if you enjoy what we do, a five-star review, view at iTunes will be hugely appreciated. It helps us to grow the podcast and secure its future. Many thanks Thanks. for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.